In this video, we're going to talk about what motivates us, that is, motivation from a psychological perspective. Motivation is very simply the drives that push us toward a specific direction. Drives are simply wants and needs that we all have. I'll go through a couple of examples, but this should be fairly obvious. And I will come back to the idea of pushing us toward a specific direction very soon, because that is what classifies this as a drive. One of the most prominent theories of motivation in psychology is known as drive reduction theory. This theory states that our drives, which include, for example, hunger, thirst, and sexual frustration, these drives motivate us to minimize the negative feelings associated with those drives. Think, for example, about being hungry. If you're hungry, this is generally an unpleasant feeling. This is a negative feeling. People don't usually like to feel hungry. So what do those negative feelings do? They push us toward a specific direction. In this case, they push us toward food. They push us to eat. And once we eat, we feel better. We feel full, which is generally a satisfied feeling, which again is sort of the process of minimizing the negative feelings associated with, in this case, hunger. Now, pushing us toward a specific direction, I'm going to come back to that point now. Some drives push us toward approach. For example, they might predispose us to move toward food, as we just saw, or uh, they might predispose us to move toward the object of our sexual desire, someone that we're attracted to, someone we have a crush on. Other drives, in contrast, push us to avoid. For example, we might want to move away from people who are rude, or we might want to run away from dangerous animals that could threaten our lives. Importantly, these drives can conflict with one another. Take, for example, the person you have a crush on, someone you really like, someone you're attracted to. Well, yes, we do have an approach orientation toward that person because we like them, we're attracted to them. We want to get to know them, spend more time with them, whatever. But we might also have sort of a tendency to avoid. We might be nervous around that person. We might be afraid of getting rejected. And so we don't even ask that person out in the first place. So drives can conflict the, the directions in which they push us. But the important thing is they are pushing us toward a specific direction, which is what makes it motivation. These drives motivate us in various ways. Drive reduction theory is a great theory, but it has a problem. It doesn't explain why we sometimes overindulge, even after our drives have been satisfied. If you're at a party, for example, that's serving pizza, you might be full after three or four slices, and yet you eat a couple of more slices after that, even to the point perhaps where you feel bad. So it's not just as simple as, okay, we you know indulge until our drives are satisfied, until those negative feelings go away. Sometimes we go beyond that and we continue to indulge even when we don't have those negative feelings associated with the lack of what we're trying to get. Now, as a result of this sort of limitation, we now in psychology tend to supplement drive reduction theory with what's known as incentive theories. So we use both in tandem. Incentive theories propose that we're often motivated by positive goals as well as negative goals. So drive reduction theory says we're just motivated by negative goals, satisfying unpleasant drives, getting rid of unpleasant negative feelings. But incentive theory says, okay, yes, sure, we do that, but we also are motivated by positive goals. For example, pleasure, the extra pleasure that those two additional slices of pizza gives us motivates us to eat those slices of pizza. Also other things like pride or applause. These are positive goals that we are after and we're obviously motivated by these things. Incentive theories tend to differentiate between two different types of motivation. One form of motivation is known as intrinsic motivation, a desire motivated by internal goals. Internal, hence the term intrinsic, within yourself. Intrinsic motivation includes things like just being interested in something, internally, being curious about something, having pride, being proud of something. In contrast, extrinsic motivation is a desire motivated by external goals, again, hence extrinsic. For example, grades, praise from other people, or receiving money for a job, for example. So think about yourself. Why are you watching this video? Are you intrinsically motivated? Do you want to learn about this content because you think it's interesting and you're curious about how motivation works? Or is it more of an extrinsic motivation? 
are you doing this purely because maybe you're in a course and you're going to be graded on this, right? Uh, on this sort of a content. So again, both are useful in different ways, but one is better than the other. Can you guess which one that is? It turns out that intrinsic motivation is better. Extrinsic motivation can actually undermine your own intrinsic motivation. It can reduce your own interest, curiosity, blah, 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 if you have an extrinsic motivation that overpowers it. To illustrate, let me talk about a classic study that sort of compares uh, how intrinsic and extrinsic motivation works in a developmental psychological context, meaning a child psychological context where children are the participants in the study. In this study, preschoolers just drew right? They draw. If you don't know any preschoolers, kids of this age generally love to draw. But there were three different conditions in which these children were randomly assigned. In condition A, children agreed to draw ahead of time to receive an award. So you went up to them before the study started, you bring them into the lab and you say, hey, will you draw me a picture? If you do, I'll give you an award. Condition B, uh, in condition B, children drew and then were surprised by an award, but there was no prior agreement. There was no verbal contract that they would be receiving an award. It was just a surprise at the end. And finally, in condition C, children drew and they received nothing. There was no mention of award. There was no award at the end. That was it. They just drew and they went on their way. Two weeks later, these preschoolers were brought back into the lab. Now, what we found in this study was that children in condition A, children who were randomly assigned to condition A, had significantly less interest in drawing again two weeks later. Condition B and condition C, these children wanted to draw. They were very happy to continue drawing, really had a lot of intrinsic motivation to do so. So why did the children in condition A lose their intrinsic natural motivation to draw? Well, for these children in condition A, drawing became more about getting the award rather than about enjoying the activity itself. If you're being paid for something, even if you enjoy doing that thing, oftentimes it might become more about getting paid rather than about the natural enjoyment, which again reduces the natural enjoyment. It inhibits your intrinsic motivation. As a final point, let's talk about needs. Again, things that motivate us, things that drive us. We have a differentiation here between primary needs, which are biological needs that are required to keep us alive. For example, hunger and thirst. We need food. We need water. These are primary needs without which we would basically die, right? Secondary needs, in contrast, are still important. They're still needs, but they aren't necessarily required for life. Secondary needs are psychological needs, such as the need for achievement, the need for self-esteem, the need for love or companionship. These are secondary psychological needs. And based on this sort of differentiation, uh, someone came around long ago who ended up being very famous for this work, Maslow and his hierarchy of needs. So the idea behind this hierarchy of needs is that we have a hierarchy of needs and some things are more important for, for life than other things. And the other idea behind this is that we can't ascend to higher levels of needs. We can't even really think about uh, a higher level need if our lower level needs are not being taken care of. So for example, we first need to sort of get those physiological, biological, primary needs out of the way. We need to be able to breathe, we need to eat, we need to drink water, all of that stuff. Once your primary biological needs, your physiological needs are met, then you can get onto the need for safety, right? Being secure, having sort of, uh, you know, employment, having uh, health, having a roof over your head, those sorts of things. Once those are taken care of, well, then we can get on to thinking about uh, love, the need for friendship, for perhaps a family, a companion, a partner. After that, self-esteem. And finally, uh, according to Maslow, few people really reach this highest level of needs. They don't get this far because some of those other needs aren't being met. But we have self-actualization, which is characterized by being your true self, being able to be creative and work on something that you find intrinsically motivated, that you care about, that contributes to a larger goal that you find very important. So you can think about your own needs, what's being met, what isn't being met, and how high on this hierarchy are you.